Welcome to People More Interesting Than Me, the podcast, where I step back and let fascinating individuals take the spotlight. Join me as I sit down with incredible guests who captivate and inspire, showcasing their stories, experiences, and wisdom that make them truly extraordinary. Tune in for engaging conversations that'll leave you enlightened and entertained. I mean, at least I'm entertained. Today, we have a truly special guest who is at the forefront of revolutionizing the podcast industry. Joining us is Ryan Estes, an American Buddhist entrepreneur and the co-founder of Wildcast, a cutting-edge podcast advertising platform designed for the world's iconic technology brands. Wildcast aims to help business and tech podcasts enhance their revenue streams while fostering meaningful connections. With a keen understanding of both the spiritual and business worlds, Ryan has facilitated thousands of extraordinary conversions and conversations through the power of podcasting. Enjoy. Hey, Michael. Hey, how's it going? It's going great, man. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. So first off, thanks for being on the podcast. I know you are a busy man. So thank you for choosing to use your time on me. I'm ha- absolutely happy to do it. You know, I live in a podcasty world. So conversations is everything for me. That's perfect. And we're going to touch about that. So I, I was reading through your bio. And the one thing that I flagged, which just makes me like, think I like I don't I have like, you know, like I've got I grew up in uh, the DMV, which is kind of like, uh, like DC area. And I've run in like, I've got friends from like every different kind of aspect, you know, like, just having dip- diplomats and everybody else here, um, you know, like Muslim, Catholic, Christian, uh, uh, Jewish, like you name it. But I don't think I have any Buddhist friends, which is crazy. Can you speak? And and you are, um, I was going to say Anglo-Saxon. You are Caucasian. I would imagine a trend for Caucasian people to be Buddhist. I'm not saying that's 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 wrong or anything. I'm just saying, how did you get to that path well i'm not caucasian how dare you oh i'm sorry i mean tribally i'm like anglican you know okay (laughs) Uh. i only differentiate because i'm a big mma fan and those caucus Mm. whites the caucus whites that there's something else man those guys are real killers so you know i i thought i was italian forever and then i did the 23 and me and it was like 99.8 percent British and I was like, Ugh. yeah, I got that too. That, that, <laughs> I got like fifty percent British, and then you know, like a mix of World War Two. Yeah, but. so you know that in response to that, I shed a tear for the Queen. I watch soccer. You know, I call it football now. Oh, that's good. But that's how we do it. So no, but but, <laughs> but to your point, and I kind of differentiate a little bit about Buddhism. And I'm trying to kind of make a differentiation around American Buddhism, um, because American Buddhism is a bunch of white boys um, and actually a lot of Jews. You know, a lot of Jews really kind of founded the American Buddhist movement in the 40s and 50s. You know, this is like um, Jack Kornfield and Paul Epstein. There's a bunch of them. Um, they call themselves the Jew booze. So <laughs> but that's to say that, like, you know. Americans, uh, largely, the experience of Buddhism, um, the entry point is usually psychedelics, um, which is to say most people, it's very difficult for Westerners to sit in a contemplative meditative state, you know, because one, you just kind of immediately don't know if you're doing it right. And you don't know what you're supposed to be doing, honestly. Um, But what psychedelics brought in the 60s was a very visceral internal mental experience in a, in a way that people were able to see that there is a terrain um, psychologically in our minds that you can traverse. And pretty much all of those folks in the fifties and sixties, Alan Watts and these characters, you know, uh, Kerouac even um, began there and started their training. And it's, it's kind of a juxtaposition largely because the irreverent hippies of the 60s could be seen as like the exact 
opposite to the austere contemplative monk that we kind of associate with, with Buddhism. So, you know, what I'm really interested in is this Buddhist experience and this Buddhist practice that is um, uniquely American. Um, there, there are a lot of folks that, that have come here and seen that America is really ripe uh, for, for, for Buddhist experience and for building a new culture. Um, because Buddhism is different. Buddhism is not necessarily a religion, you know? And they're not trying to convert anybody. Rather, it's they they kind of infect a culture and it it soaks up everything around it and forms to that container. So American Buddhism is like taking on its own kind of unique dynamics. And so I am very interested in Buddhism as a student and a practitioner, largely because it is a practice. There's nothing to believe in Buddhism. It's kind of interesting that it kind of gets lop, lopped in with religions, um, because most certainly you could be a Buddhist and also be a practicing theist or atheist um, in almost any tradition. They're, they're not at odds with each other. Um, so for me personally, it is the actual direct experience it's the direct experience that uh, I'm most interested in and what I think that the Americans can really bring to the Buddhist table. Okay. Yeah. So just touching on that, I, I feel like that makes complete sense because when you think about, when I think about the United States and maybe it expands to other countries in the world, I just think of, you know, like the hustle culture. I think of like the older generation of, you know, boomers who are like, work till you die and it just makes sense that's that's kind of like a vacuum like you see all these people and i talked to i talked to someone a couple of weeks ago on burnout and this is exactly kind of what this falls into something that's kind of like i don't want to say check engine light but more like a like a system of kind of self remediation where you're you're kind of like i don't know flowing freely while still maintaining your 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 be your being if that makes sense kind of like your yourself but still growing mm. I, that that's what it at least sounds like to me which sounds like a perfect con like contrapositive to kind of where we're at as a culture right now you know like everyone one of the big things with the burnout was that we're kind of seasonal beings where we need to rest like we need to hibernate at some point where we need to rest. It's not just like on to the next thing. Like, oh, we finished this. Now let's do, we've got five other things to do. Like it's more yeah. like not being happy, but being well rested while doing the things we love. Absolutely. And there's, there's techniques all around what they call non-sleep deep rest which is exactly what it sounds like, you know, it's totally secular, but it's like intentionally deciding um, that you're scheduling time to rest, <laughs> which is a Amer very Western thing, you know, um, a buddy of mine owns a couple of centers where they have float tanks. And that's a great example of that, where it's like, well, what are you going to do in there? Like, well, you're going to float on your back for 90 minutes, have fun, do whatever you want, but that's what you're doing is floating. So, you know, a lot of these like practices are kind of counterintuitive for our culture. But if you look at some of the things that kind of nag our culture, you got anxiety, depression, and stress that are kind of like ramping up. I mean, they're at all time levels um, and they're, they're only getting, you know, more challenging um, because the idea of, of doing nothing for its sake, <laughs> it hasn't really, it, it hasn't been introduced here. You know, they, they call it a Protestant work ethic for a reason, gosh darn it. And, you know, we all reap the benefits of that technology. You know, we're all looking for the technology that's going to give us our time back, but we just end up filling it with more things and more technology. So, you know, a lot of these techniques, and there's, there's a lot of, there's a big barrier to entry, you know, like before we started on, you're like, I don't really want to talk about religion. It's like, I, I totally get it, you know, but like that kind of like, stigma of like if i'm if i'm studying like meditation practices is this actually the devil trying to deceive me and get in my head i mean there's like kind of there's that stigma or if there's like i should be doing something with my time xyz there there's that there's also kind of this like 
weird obsession we have with piety and perfection like oh god what if i became enlightened then i i maybe i won't have a sense of humor and i won't enjoy my family or i'm gonna have to renounce everything and give it all away and, and it, we have these ideas um uh, based around like um you know purity and and expectations that people just stay away from when really at its core you know i, I think what what buddhism has to offer is that like you know you can you can take a break you can you can you can hit pause you know and it's actually very very satisfying and what's kind of interesting and it's not necessary you can literally take a pause and do whatever but there's something else here you know that and it's here all the time it's with us in our consciousness and it's very very pleasing and that if you can kind of find a way to settle into that um at all times might be your goal, but like if settle into it a couple times a day, it just enhances and enriches everything that's happening around you. Um, but again, that it's it's hard to talk about kind of some experiences I think with compl- contemplative uh, practices because if you're pursuing them, they run away. You know, so it's yeah. interesting. Yeah, because speaking from like. The only thing I've ever learned on Buddhism was from probably like a, uh, you know, like a world history class in like like twelfth grade or something like that, and that's basically to the extent that I know. And obviously, you know, I'm reading books that were probably made in like 1995, where there was a completely different agenda to what we're at currently, and the knowledge obviously was based off of. Uh, you know, like the encyclopedias that were going door to door rather than uh, the actual internet or, I don't know, less uh, <laughs> less informative and uh, The guy at the means. mall. Yeah. Well, guy, and yeah. honestly, pe- pe- people have, have reason to be skeptical. They most certainly should because there was also like the early, some of them, some of the early Buddhist teachers were also like exploiting their students. You know, unfortunately, they're um, you, it, they were kind of wrapped into like this guru nonsense, and whether that was like sex with their students, sex within the organizations they were doing, you know, robbing people of their money, the same things associated with cults and religion and yeah. all that stuff is it was rampant. You know, it, particularly you know we're here in 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 Denver. I'm here in Denver, and the the base of the Shambhala sect of buddhism sect which is kind of an offshoot of tibetan buddhism that's you know kind of uh westernized is up in boulder and their founding member is a guy named um chagyam trungpa rinpoche who is absolutely brilliant i mean if you read his work it like it vibrates like the 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 kind of like frequency this guy was on which is to say that he's like very spiritually talented and saying spiritual is a, is a weird word. It's a loaded word, whatever. Um, but he is. And I, I believe that like some people have talent in spirituality, you know, the same way that Michael Jordan has talent. Like he's what he was six, seven, he can just jump like that. Of course he worked really hard to nurture that, but in the same way, Jordan can play basketball. Chagyam Trungpa Rinpoche could could be a spiritualist (laughs) where he was born with talent. And then he developed that into like absolute greatness. And his writing is amazing. Now, the problem is, is that he founded this school with like Allen Ginsberg and all these like crazy guys. And he blew it. You know what I mean? He totally blew it. Like I think he married a 16 year old. He was a massive raging alcoholic, a, 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 a total madman. You know, so again, like in our culture, like we have this idea that people that have spiritual or religious piety are somehow better than us and are some somehow like moral and ethical people, but they're completely separate domains. I would never think that Michael Jordan was an ethical person, you know, just because he played basketball and he's Michael Jordan. I mean, it seems like he was a pretty ethical guy, but the point is, is that people like oftentimes with like spiritual teachers or when they get into like you know, purity testing of these things. It's like, dude, if, if the, the spiritual teacher that you're interested in can't pass a sniff test, as far as ethics run away, 
you know, it, because they are brilliant and they are coercive and they will suck you in and maybe you don't want to be in there. So my personal attitude again, so I'm, I want to talk about my own experience with American Buddhism, but I've also been like kind of shunned from Buddhist communities because I am, I, I'm not there. I'm not a joiner. You know what I'm saying? I'm probably more of like a tourist. Like I'm really interested in like what's happening here, but also it's got to pass a, a pretty big sniff test because I'm not ready to drink the Kool-Aid, so to speak, and never will be. So, <laughs> so I think when people are reluctant, you know, for any kind of spiritual or religious path, they really have just cause. Um, but I'm also here to say that there is a there there. There is something there. Um, and it's magnificent. No, that's great. Great perspective, especially coming to someone with like me with almost zero knowledge <laughs> or experience or perspectives from anyone else. Um, okay, to do a 180, let's get back to kind of, I, I thought a good way to start this off would be, how has podcasting take a role in your life? Like, what is it to you? Podcasting in the, the role in my life? Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting because it does kind of dovetail a little bit into the Buddhist stuff. Because one thing that I really like about Buddhists is their love of lists. And they've got the four noble truths and they got the 10 list of this, 10 list of that. One of those lists is right livelihood. And that's something I did take take to heart. There's straight ahead rules like no weapons, no intoxicants, no things like that. Um, but also it's it's inviting you to think bigger of like, what does right livelihood mean for you? And I have the the great pleasure of working in podcasting. That's how I make my livelihood is through podcasting. And it really actually um, feeds me in, uh, in a deep way. Because to me, podcasting is all about connection. And, you know, what we're doing here, we get to know each other a little bit. And that's really exciting. There's nothing like first impressions. There's nothing like conversations when you don't have your, your phone present, you know, and as a result, you know, people get to listen to it. So I get to listen to other people's podcasts and have that same experience of, of communication. And um, to me, it's really important. So, you know, uh, right now, the project I have is a company called Wildcast that basically marries brands audiences and podcasters in a way that really works for everybody, you know? So, uh, you know, podcasting in my life is, <laughs> is, is significant presence. And I'm really proud to be able to do it because I, I think so highly of podcasters, generally speaking, not only what they're doing for their audience, but also I think there's an intrinsic kind of uh, curiosity about the world. They're reaching into the world to, to find something new. So I, I'm very honored to be a part of it. No, that's great. And obviously, me speaking to that, I, I'm i glad there there's people out there supporting because sometimes small people like myself you, calling into a cave that there's nobody listening to with when there's people like you and other organizations or companies that are kind of helping you guys are like a megaphone. And you're mm -hmm. basically expanding our reach, helping us get out there because I, I know a lot of people out there, they think like podcasting, you name a celebrity, they've either been on numerous podcasts or they have their own podcasts, and then they just pull their followers to it. But then you've got people who just start podcasts who are unknowns, and they're really grinding it out. And those are mm. the people I feel like need the most help of anyone. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, um, and don't sell yourself short. I mean, I know I'm on the podcast called people more interested than me that's your brand you're very on brand yes but, <laughs> but um yeah podcasting for its own merits is deeply satisfying and fun you know it is a form of entertainment and every form of entertainment seems to kind of follow this law that is one percent of creators make 99 percent of the money you know i mean i don't know why that is but it's like who are the big movie stars? Probably about 1% actors. You go into you go into the bookstore at the airport, it's the same 10 books. Stephen King, Dan Brown, J.K. Rowling. Are there any other authors? No. 
yeah. music the same way, you know, it, this is kind of how it goes. And, and podcasting doesn't, um, doesn't dis- disobey that. But what, what podcasting has is like um, something different. They, they have a higher quality of attention. You know, so what we're talking about, what's interesting to us is what we consider niche audiences, which is a nice way to say that these are podcasts that will never have gigantic audiences. You know, there can only be so many true crime shows. There can only be so many Huberman's and Rogan's and comedians and, you know, Conan and everybody else, you know, that are using this as a way to promote their celebrity. And I love those shows, but honestly, if I'm listening to those shows, they get about 10% of my attention. Cause I, they're like old friends. You're like, Oh, okay. It's a Rogan. What's up. Who he's got on. Doesn't even matter. It's just going to play for a while. But what you find it with uh, specialized niche audiences, particularly where we're interested, which is like, you know, podcasts that are helping solve problems. So this is like B2B, SaaS, technology, e-commerce, marketing, sales, like people, podcasts that people are listening to, to find new tools, to find solutions in their businesses, to, to make them better as professionals, to make them better as individuals. Well, those don't get 10% of my attention. Those might get 90% of my attention, you know, and these kind of podcasts will never grow to be gigantic, but, but the, the relationship I have with that podcast is, is more important than a celebrity type show. So we really created this, this platform as a, as a, as a way to like celebrate the podcasts that are talking into the void they're like wow you know i i don't have enough listeners i only have twenty thousand monthly listeners you know where we're like dude that is absolutely fantastic Twenty thousand listeners is huge especially it depends on who those twenty thousand people are um so what we're able to do is you know is match relevancy of who those 20,000 listeners are with the outcomes that brands are looking for and use kind of host red um, endorsements as a means to connect the two. And, um, it's great. It's, it it really works. You know, the, the research is extraordinary with converting through, um, podcasts, but I think it also just speaks to like, you know, kind of an older adage of like, you know, people are talking around a campfire and you have a recommendation of the good hunting spot. That's where you go. So we're out here doing that. Yeah, no. And and that's, I mean, that's how, I mean, I can't even think about when I, you know, started listening to podcasts, not making podcasts, but it's, I feel like I'm a, I'm a big utility guy. I feel like, and this is probably a bad thing, but I feel like I should always be doing something or, you know, getting better, but, and that's what I feel most of the time with podcasting or listening to podcasts specifically yeah. is like, if I'm driving to work, I got to listen to something that either, you know, gives me good perspective, gives me some knowledge that'll, you know, improve a skill or something like that. The sad thing is I, I don't think I've ever really listened. Well, true, true crime, but like humor or stuff like that. When I look towards podcasts, I look for, you know, like knowledge and making myself better. Um, but well, and- it's a contagion, like literally it's a viral contagion. I mean, I wake up every day. I don't know. Some people are morning people. I am not. I wake up every day and feel terrible. My body feels terrible. I feel negative. I feel like the day is too long and I wish I could sleep more and I want to eat something different. From- I feel terrible every single day. And it's amazing that through through podcasts or even audiobooks, like I put that on. And I tell you, just by the time I'm, you know, in my truck getting getting to work, I have completely 180 and I'm like fired up. Like there's like, there's a there's something that happens psycho-emotionally, which is great, but I can feel better in my body. You know, I don't know why that is. I mean, is there science behind the fact that like you listen to stimulating conversation and like your body feels better? It's weird. You know, it's not quantifiable on like a, on like a spreadsheet, but I I think there's a reason why there's two and a half million podcasts, you know, it's because probably 10 million people are listening to shows and they're like, dude, I want to give this a shot because it's given me so much. I mean, you know how it is. Like, it's not easy having a podcast. You got to do a lot of different stuff to get it out there. It's difficult, but like, it's almost a way like podcasters understand that they can give back because they get so much out of it. And it's, it's a weird thing. Like, how does it affect my body? I don't, I don't know. 
Yeah. I, I was, I, I feel like it's, a, it's going to sound stupid, but evolutionary thing where like, for example, I, I, I was listening to a podcast probably, and they were saying that the best way to like make goals and center, center yourself for future stuff is a writing it down, not, not typing it up, but writing it down like that motor memory or even, even recording it and hearing yourself say it like, oh, I'm going to get up and run two miles this morning. You record it. You even say it. You put it into your alarm. Can you imagine like just thinking of yourself saying, hey, get up and run? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's great. Well, and you know, honestly, like that's something I had to get better at because I have that voice inside my head. I don't say it, but it's very mean. It doesn't say it politely calls me terrible names, but it's very motivating. And again, like what you're talking about, it's interesting how these things go in cycles and how like everything is all the same, but we create new words for it. You know? So like, if you're talking about writing something down, that's literally magic. That's like, if you were a Druid prince, you would be writing things down as a magical spell because, you know, mute magic at its core level is exerting your will into the universe. And for some reason, you know, we call it muscle memory. Yeah, it's all scientific. You know, muscle memory, you write it down, it, it puts it into your memory synapses. But back then they'd be like, this is conjuring some kind of magical uh, fairy that's going to make sure you follow through and do it. And it does, you know. So yeah, like vo vocal notes, like listening to yourself, hearing positive affirmations, hearing a, an expert who is like, describing something that you already know to be true in a way that your brain consumes like it's like cotton candy you know i mean the the best kind of information whether it's business or otherwise is stuff that you're like dude yes 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 this is all clicking to me i already knew this but i didn't know how to describe it you know yeah and it's important to hear the description because then you can experience it faster you know so i it, it's interesting you know because it truly is a lot of these things are like products of magic of like, how do we bring our will into the world? And if what you want to, if what you're trying to will into the world is I want to bring, I want to get better at what I do and what's important to me and the, for the people around me that love me, that respect me, that have, that actually have expectations duly that I show up well in the world. Well, you, you got to believe that I'm going to do every single magical spell that I possibly can to make that happen. But what we've learned is that like, Magic is nonsense, but God dang podcasts get me fired up. <laughs> yeah. So, so speaking on what, what you were saying on kind of niche podcasts, how, how would you say, like, for example, I mean, you know, like there, there's some, uh, and I'm not trying to make a generalization with older generations, but I would say older generations don't really understand podcasts. Like you have to, you kind of have to break them into it. You have to get them like, you literally have to put the headphones on their ears and find the specific like categories and stuff like that. And I, I'm not trying to make the specific to older generations, but how do you get to the people? Um, because this isn't like, I, I guess you could make the argument for some people that they wouldn't like it, but this is for everyone. Like there's just like you were saying, there's subjects from, you know, like, if you like scuba or you love, let's say, Antarctica, stuff like that, how would you say you get those groups of people who've never experienced podcasts and you try to use or try to convert or get them to try this for those people that you got, got where you were saying like 20,000 people into followers? Like they love, let's say, you know, like kangaroos and you're trying to get kangaroo lovers to listen to this podcast how would you how do you source that for older generations well not older generations just non-podcast listeners or or let's say like for example maybe there is people who know about podcasts but they don't know that there's so many podcasts out there like for example something super niche that they don't even think it would be out there how do you reach those people do you you know we're on this like spiritual kick so we could just keep it there <laughs> i like it <laughs> I, I swear i don't talk about this stuff ever but so i'm enjoying the opportunity um 
but particularly let's say that like it is older generation because what we know is that the median age of television is 47 and the medium age of podcasting is 37 there's a full generation or two generations difference in age podcasts uh they skew much younger and so if we're looking at uh, a generation up above you know what are some of the attributes that they're they're dealing with why are they tuning into television still it's bananas but you know when we were talking about magical spells earlier who are the wizards of our time it's these news guys these talking news guys you know i mean next time you're watching the news put in your mind first that this is a wizard and then he's trying to hypnotize me to buy pharmaceuticals on the the commercial breaks because that's what they're doing you know, it's it's very interesting, the media landscape. And often I, I really feel like podcast is like a salve that's kind of healing some of these things in our culture because the media truly is, especially the news, is that they're just shills for whoever's advertising on their show. Now, I'm not downing advertising because I am an advertiser. <laughs> that's my thing. Um, but how would you do that? If you're out there and you want to capitalize and, and do, give the best possible ad read for your advertisers, you would. Maybe you would talk in a stern, monotone type voice that might be a little uh, hypnotizing to your audience. Maybe you would stare directly into the camera and speak in monosyllabic tones and then break for commercial. You know, everything they're doing is the good magic. You know, not only that, but they're they're stratifying everybody into their their uh, tribal camps. Like, are you the the guns and Jesus guy? Awesome. We got a product for you. Are you the the free Palestine and green hair people? Cool. We got a product for you. They're putting you in a box and reminding you what box you're in all the time. But the thing is, is that there's bleed all over the place everywhere where people's boxes are spilling at other people's boxes all the time. And this is what podcasting opens up to you. You know what I'm saying? It's like, how much do you really care about this election coming up in 2024 in comparison to your fandom of adult Disney? Like, I love Disney as an adult. That's actually who you are. You know, and there's like, I know several amazing podcasts about adult, not adult Disney in like an adult triple X kind of way. I'm saying people who are adults who enjoy Disney with their kids. That's that's more likely uh, a, a that's closer kin of their tribe than any kind of political affiliations. And you find that with podcasting. So, like, how are we going to break people out of, like, some of the magical spells that they're under that have been cast down by whoever knows why they're doing it? Well, I think we ask them to look inside themselves a little bit more and, and discover, like, what they're really into. You know, are, are you really obsessed with how much? America is spending in the Ukraine right now, or are you like, you like fly tying, you know, what do you, what do you really like to do? You know, so we're, we're at this kind of crux right now, I think culturally where people have been spun into a tizzy about like all these things that don't really affect them and don't really have that much to do with who they are, as opposed to if they found out, did some reflection of what they're really into and were able to connect with other people through podcasting is a great way, then it's going to bring out not these tribal tensions, but rather this joyous love that they can share together. So, you know, I don't know, that's, that's quite a monologue to figuring out how we can get people into podcasts a little bit more, but I think it, it helps. I honestly think it really helps, you know, bring people together as opposed to push people apart, you know, and if I could be, have my, uh, have a right livelihood in the sense that like I'm helping advertisers connect all those dots that's wonderful. That's absolute beautiful thing to do. And I don't feel like I'm a evil wizard standing on in front of a camera. No, I, to be fair, I, I, I felt this probably for the last five or 10 years, or maybe most of my life that the news is slowly, I mean, it's slowly dying. I mean, I, none of my friends watch the news. No, I, I just don't know where it's going to be in like the next 10 years. I mean, if they don't have the advertisement that, and I, I would imagine advertisers aren't going to stick around. Obviously, they'll stick around for the older generations that are slowly going to funnel out of watching yeah. the news, but they're it's going to follow the money. Like if if adver, if advertisers aren't getting what they need from the news and the news, I mean, that's the main way that the news is funded. Like, absolutely, yeah. Well, and I mean, we it would be different. Like, I, I think we might be the only country in uh, first world country that allows pharmaceutical drugs to advertise in the news 
You know, it's weird that if you're selling a drug that makes you feel better, that you wouldn't spend the first 12 minutes making people feel bad. I mean, that's smart sales to me, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, so I, I, I don't know. I don't know if there's like, uh, there's maybe legislative things you could do, but I, I'm not a huge fan of that necessarily. It seems pretty democratic that you just see people pulling back. They're like, dude, I don't really want to have, a, you know, someone lecturing me and telling me the way I should think or anything else, or, you know, which is too bad because there's, there's obviously important things that are happening in the world. I, I don't have the solution for it, um, but, you know, it, it is changing. You know, people are now getting their their news from TikTok. And as we're coming into this world of generative AI, like nobody's going to know anything anymore, which is going to be another challenge. You know, I I had my daughter sent me like all these TikToks of like Kevin Durant and LeBron James just absolutely trashing their teams. And she's like, I can't believe they say that. I'm like, dude, this is fake. You can't tell. And she's like, no. I was like, no, no, no. Look, look at the mouth very subtly. It's so good, you know, now, if you're, we're talking about in 12 months, dude, it's going to be, it's going to be bananas. You know, there's not going to be any so source of truth. It, all there's going to be is memes. So, I mean, what does that mean? I, I, I don't know. But again, I think it might come down to like the importance of podcasts and like finding trusted sources of people that are normal individuals. They're not dressed on a soundstage with makeup on, you know, you know, trying to, self whatever on the commercial breaks it's like no nah, man i've been listening to michael's podcast for three years man you know so there there's trust built there and i think that those bonds are going to become more valuable than than ever yeah the, the way you mentioned the ai it just it just hits me like a reset switch you know like if you can't trust like something in your face that's something as simple as the video you discussed like in theory you should question everything and i feel like that's the biggest issue with people listening to news or you know my, i always try to make this relatable but like my wife looks at instagram every day she is one of the greatest mothers i know but she sees these other mothers you know the ones who are like you know like uh tire swing like making something in the kitchen but like these these people have professional chefs they have maids like they're trying to make people <laughs> and other mothers think that you're a bad mother. And I think it's crazy. It's just like, it, it it's just hard to get a vision of what is right and wrong when you have so many avenues coming at you at the same time that aren't uh, not, uh, not approved, but like credible or reliable or something. It's kind of like, when you get food, if you're eating Slim Jims or stuff like fruit roll-ups, all this stuff with, I, I I love those foods by the way, but if you're if you keep only eating those foods, you're bound to you know like A B C D of medical uh, ailments, and that's the same thing with all the information you take in. So touching back on the podcasting thing, if if you're getting someone's opinion, and obviously. I, I, I don't know if you can apply this to the, you know, the big 10 or big 20 we were talking about, but those people usually speak their opinion and nine times out of the 10, usually the information is fact checked as well. I'm not, I'm not saying that a hundred percent of it is, but you're really getting someone's voice. You're not getting a puppet. Like we were talking about the news where, you know, everything is curated for them. Everything follows the advertisers, like, you know, like the 20 advertisers, 30, I, I don't know how many advertisers these news organizations have, but they can't say, they have a list of, you know, like you can't say things. You have to stick to the script. Whereas podcasting is kind of, you're speaking from your own, your own opinion, your own beliefs, what you don't believe, you're learning. It's not something that's set in stone or set, you know, for 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 the, the common good. Most times people are speaking with what, their opinion is even if it's a opinion that you hate opinion you love yeah it it doesn't seem to have spilled into like am radio where it <clears throat> though and speaking of am radio is kind of like where they got crazy conspiratorial and like all that stuff there is like a 
there's a thread of goodwill in podcasting, generally speaking. Of course, there's some fringe cases, but I think most people do want to speak their opinion, but they're not like married to it. And they're also like willing to like insert humor and or just brevity in general. And like, there's, I'll put it this way. There's a patina of charming amateurism in podcasting where people aren't pretending to wear their grandfather's pants and like they're the definitive source of, of subjects like you get with network news programs where where it's like oh you ted koppel i mean i respect your pedigree but like you study journalism dude are you a historian <laughs> you know i don't know and, and why am i even confrontational about that kind of stuff it's because they set themselves up for it you know yeah so i, I don't know i don't know i know that like like you're saying instagram boy, real tough for gals, you know, having, you know, sisters and a wife and a daughter. It's like, man, be careful out there. I mean, those algorithms have figured out what I like, you know, which is sports highlights and advertisements for black sweatpants, you know, so I'm good, but <laughs> I'm not, I don't compare myself unfairly to like, you know, MLB, you know, I can't, I never could pitch like that. So you know, I know it's real tough, tough for gals. I'm sure it's tough on guys too. But again, I, I think that like social media is, is oftentimes, you know, toxic in our culture. And again, this is a point where podcasting comes in to help soothe those things, you know, because yeah. I, I think even pointing the finger at, at social media might be helpful for somebody else to be like, oh yeah, actually I, I realize that I am under the spell of this algorithm that's making me feel a certain way. And that I gravitate towards podcasting because it makes me feel something else. It makes me feel good. You know, it's rare you you step away from an hour on, you know, doom scrolling on Instagram and your body feels better. You know? Yeah. Sometimes it does. I don't know. It depends if it's a playoffs. Yeah, that's true. Uh, one last thing I wanted to touch on is obviously after the – I, I haven't fact checked this, but I would assume the the main time people are kind of inhaling podcasts is on their commutes. They're trying to, you know, multitask, get to work, also either, you know, enjoy like I do, uh, like a nice educational podcast or humor, anything like that. Obviously, with COVID, there's been a huge slash in people driving to work, even doing a hybrid, you know, like go to work. Uh or a stay at home how has podcasting kind of shifted since then um what what have the trends been for that well you know podcasting saw a gigantic spike during covid um largely because sports were done and hollywood couldn't make anything for like six months so there really was podcast was the only content we had you know um, and since then, the the growth hasn't accelerated to the same extent, but it's still growing. Um, and there's a lot of like new fun tools as creators that are out there for you. There's a lot of new monetization opportunities like Wildcast, which keep you know podcasters in the chair doing it. Um, and and honestly, I, I'm bullish, obviously, <laughs> in podcasting business in general. Um, but but that that comes from something deeper. You know, there's always going to be a new technology. There's going to be new ways that we can connect with each other in a meaningful and genuine way. There's going to be generative AI, and there already is um, for podcasting. But I don't. I think this is going to be a space where you're going to keep the realness, and people are going to come to it because they want more of a human touch. You know, I could make my own video game with my creativity. It's like, nah, man, I need to talk. Listen to Michael's podcast. What am I doing here? Making a a logo for my 37th fictional business. What am I doing with generative AI? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah, podcasting is strong. The business is growing well, and it's, it's always open for new, for new voices. You know, I really encourage people all the time that if like you enjoy podcast content, go out there and try it yourself, you know, and contribute something to it because um, chances are that you're going to be the entry point for somebody else that's meaningful for them because you started. You know, so, you know, Michael, I appreciate you and your, your podcast. I think you, this as corny as it sounds contributes to a better world, you know? Yeah. And I obviously enjoy doing it as well. So it's, 
it feels therapeutic at some points and that's yeah. why i think i i've kept going uh but yeah and i appreciate what you do as well because just like you said i mean it, in the end i mean there's some way that the podcast need to keep going because you guys are that essential step you know like some podcasters obviously don't want to be you know working at mcdonald's or working at as no offense to insurance claim adjusters but they want to be able to take a solid step out to something they love to podcast and you guys are there to help support that with your role you kind of make it like hey we can do this on an economical level you can like do what you love so you guys are kind of like the uh fairy godmothers to podcasters out there that kind of want to uh actually have a meaningful and happy job and what they do inspires a ton of other people or makes their lives a little bit more enjoyable so thank you i love that i i'm grateful to be a fairy godmother <laughs> <laughs> whatever uh gender godmother you prefer to be god person how <laughs> dare you sir no uh, godmothers is the, is, the, is the right way because you want if it's a fairy they need to be nurturing like a godmother sure. you know God, yeah, because you were right. Because if you were the Godfather, that would be, you know, very Godfather is kind of scary. Yeah, he's it's, gonna have like a white cat and a red carnation on his tuxedo. Yes, I don't. I don't remember the cat. I'm getting like Austin Powers or <laughs> Doctor <laughs> Doctor No vibes. Uh, um, Rindo, you know what I'm talking about. I got gotcha. you. Okay. <laughs> The final question, the uh, one everyone has been waiting for. Uh, what is something your parents did that uh, you'd like to pass on to the next generation? And the other side of it, what is something different or new that uh, you would do than your parents did? You bet. I appreciate that. My kids are in high school, so I've given this a lot of thought. And my, I love my folks too. They're, they're amazing. So one thing they always did for me is encourage me to be involved and they're supportive in that. For me, it was sports when I was a kid, you know, and that's something I have passed on. Although selfishly, because I didn't really get my kids into organized sports until they're probably about 10, because I don't know if you've ever watched six-year-olds play T-ball, but it takes three hours and it's in July. We're not doing that. We're doing martial arts till 10. So <laughs> that's what I did. <laughs> I completely agree with that. I don't know if you've ever, I hate citing books on the podcast, but I, I feel like it's so relatable. There's a book called Range and it talks about like, just like expanding your kids, you know, like motor skills, like doing gymnastics, doing a bunch of different sports to kind of like expand their range, kind of know their body. Uh, and I don't know, I, I love the book because it it speaks to the Renaissance like person in me just to know a bunch of different skills. Yeah. Movement's great. And ball sports are awesome too, but you also, you will develop a certain, uh, meridian dominance. You know, I've grown up playing like ball sports my entire life. My right hand and arm is way stronger than my left, you know? So, you know, we didn't do that with my kids. And then the second part of your question was, um, what would you do differently? Yeah. Cool. Well, my parents were boomers and they were total boomers, you know, the, the boomers and, you know, we we're having a religious conversation and they're, they're Christians and good Christians, possibly more Christian than Jesus, you know? So there was a lot of things. I don't know. There was a boomer handbook about how to raise kids and like create arbitrary rules that nobody understands why you're doing or enforcing. But my folks did that. I'll share a story with you. When I was a sophomore in high school, during the summer, my dad said, you're going to empty the ice trays into the ice bucket every single day. And every day you don't do that, um, you're going to be grounded at the beginning of school. And I was like, yeah, cool, whatever. What? Why? Well, you need to learn about responsibility. I was like, okay, cool, man, whatever. So I don't know. How long is the how long is summer vacation? 40, 45 days? I was suspended. I was uh, uh, grounded for like the first three weeks of my junior year in high school. <laughs> and I'm telling the story now because I'm still bitter and resentful about that. And having kids that are the same age in high school, I'm just like, 
why in the world did they pull that? That seems like the weirdest thing. I had. I remember my 10-year high school anniversary. Wonderful girl named Bree. She wanted to go to homecoming. And I was like, dude, I'm grounded. She was like, why? I was like, well, I didn't empty these ice cubes into a bucket. <laughs> it, was my, it was on my 10-year anniversary that she was like, you know, you, if you didn't want to go to homecoming with me, I really liked you. You didn't have to lie about it. And I was like, no, no, Bree, I really liked you too. I really liked you. I uh, Can we go to homecoming? <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah so i think one of the things that i was careful to do with my kids is not have these weird rules and as a matter of fact i didn't have any rules except for one with my kids and they've turned out pretty good no that's good you say you only had one rule what's the rule one rule of the estes household is do not be intentionally annoying hmm. that's it i like that <laughs> that's pretty good it solves a lot of problems because it's like, dude, I can tell what you're doing, but this is intentionally annoying. So let's stop. I like that. I'll add that. I'll add that to the list. <laughs> uh, and no escapes. Is there? Oh, and I, I was going to ask you. You, it, I thought you were going to. I don't know. I still have the ice cube trays. I thought you were going to say something like that, but that's, <laughs> that's completely crazy. Uh, I've got an auto ice maker now, like a real American. Yeah, we don't need our kids to do these jobs anymore. Darn it! Exactly. Man, that's crazy. By the way, what was the ice cubes for? Just cooling beverages. I don't okay. know. Hmm. What was the fridge? Yeah, I, it, it so does. So weird. Uh, is there anything you're working on? Anything that uh, you want people to know about? <laughs> Part of me. No, not at all. Not at all. Um, if anyone wants to get in contact with me, LinkedIn is kind of the, the place where I play on social media. I do stuff all over the place, but um, LinkedIn is a good place to find me, particularly if you know you're you're interested in podcast business. Um, I can point you in a good direction. I don't know if you if people need podcast advertising for B2B SaaS and tech brands um, necessarily. We're certainly a home for that. But me personally, I, I you know, um, I'm happy to be a resource wherever I can for people interested in this media and point you in a good direction if that'd be helpful. That's great. And I, obviously, I'll link you when I put up the episode and all that stuff. Well, thank you very much, Ryan, for being on the show. You bet. Thanks, Michael. No problem. Have a good one. You too. If you like this week's episode of People More Interesting Than Me, please follow me on Apple Podcasts so you won't miss out on more episodes like these.